I want to know, maybe probably like a lot of you, who is Dr. Mix? Why is he Dr. Mix? <laughs> what is his name? Why does he make these videos? Um, I want to cover that throughout the interview and then do a lightning round that's designed around questions that I pulled up on Google. Um, and they're most often asked questions and we can get it. Maybe the reason um, Dr. Mix came here to get some things from me as a source, now we get it right from the source and find out why we love you so much and why we watch your videos and why we learn from you. You know, you must know something <laughs> and you do it in such a way, it's so entertaining and fun. But there's a lot of information there too. And that's, that's a real combination and that's why you're so popular. So welcome to LA. Thank you for being here. I'm very uh, happy to have you here and excited to hear about all of these things. Oh. What do you think? You ready to do it? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled, you know. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I have a love relationship with LA. I studied orchestral composing and arranging here. And this is the, the, the town that made me really understand a few things that turned out to be very important in life. So, you know, to have this welcome from you, like this is, this is really thrilling. Very welcome. Uh... You're here. <laughs> we spent last night our first meeting in person at the Hollywood Bowl celebrating Quincy's 90th birthday party with a lot of the people that we've worked with over the years here and he got a chance to meet some of them. So you kind of alluded to the fact that you've been here before. Yeah. So where's the best place to start? Because we wanna know about your background, where you learned music. So eventually you got here to learn it, but did you start somewhere else? Where were you born? Yeah. Who the hell is Dr. Mix? <laughs> That's right. So I was born in Italy um, uh, and uh, I displayed uh, uh, an aptitude <laughs> and an and, 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 uh, inclination for musical instruments right from the get. So my brother recently told me the episode where basically, uh, you know, we got this Bon Tempi organ, which was like really glorified melodica with, uh, you know, with one of those uh, fans inside of it that kind of thing and my brother told me that uh, he was four or five he was probably five or six and I was like two and uh, he was trying to play this thing and figure it out and I showed up put my hands up I couldn't literally see the the Bon Tempi organ and I started playing imitating songs from the TV that's how tall you were yeah yeah exactly so it's like I must have been like two or three and, uh, and he was very disappointed about that, of course. <laughs> and as a result, uh, I ended up being the, uh, the musician in the house. So natural proclivity. It, it, yeah, it's for whatever reason, I, I just resonated with the instrument. So I would never let go of it. So it was like some kind of obsession uh, that, that started immediately. So, so then, of course, my, my parents, being the good Italians that they are, uh, told me, well, if you're gonna be serious about this music thing, well, you better study classical music. So they were right about that. And I studied classical music. I started at the age of nine. And, uh, and what happened, so from, you said two or three. Yeah. And then between two oh, and three and I, nine, you were between, just like jamming out on this. To, until to, eventually you... Yeah, until eventually I got up. You could see the up, keys. I could see the then you, keys. Then did you figure out more things on your own? Yes, then I got a, uh, a, another Bon Tempi organ. This, this one was electronic and it allowed me to do a bit more things. So I would pull down themes from the TV and I would use a recorder because of course, <clears throat> you know, it was a linear <laughs> uh, transmission. So if, if you wanted to listen to the same thing twice, you have to be so lucky to have a recorder handy and just record it from the TV. So I would do that and then play it back and try to figure it out. Uh, and, that, and that was like ongoing because yes, I had to go to school, but I hated it because it was distracting me from the music. But that's gold because you didn't learn, the, you didn't really get into the classical until nine. So you, it sounds like you had six years maybe of developing your ear. 100%. Ear training before you went into classical music because a lot of kids go into classical music like really young and it's a bit robotic yep. you're just like regurgitating pieces but your ear isn't really developed so you're yep. that's kind of an interesting way to do it y yeah i mean you know it just so happened that way you know and it's a, I, I, it's a story that i hear uh, from other people and it's just the level of obsession you know like i really couldn't let it go and uh so so yeah i studied classical piano piano good teacher 
I had, I had, I had, yeah, I had mixed fortune with teachers. Of course, you know, Italy is very, uh, you know, when when it comes to classical music, this is serious stuff. So dogmatic. You have, yeah, dogmatic. You know, it's like, dong, dong, you know, learn how to land and, oh, and you know scales, articulation, and hours and hours on on, on the instrument. So how much technique versus playing music? Did you do a lot of technique? It was and only and technique. Journey? Only it was only well basically classical music would mean that understand the music notation and play it. The, the more difficult the, the the piece, the more challenging it was. The more y y you would learn. That you learn the, the technique through the music, or did you actually do like you know hand position exercises like Cherny? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've done I've done Bayer. I've done I would go uh, Hanan. Uh, you know all the books. Uh, from 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 the classical you know s studies the technique stuff yeah but but no harmony no melody no nothing okay, like okay. there was no musicianship in that it, which is which is part of why I I I was I, I grew a little bit bored of classical music because it wasn't challenging for me I I wanted to make it I just yeah. wanted to interpret it because your ear was like dying to hear things yeah like not just scales you wanted to hear it like in a different sequence of mute like what music is. 100% plus, you know, imagine that I was fixated, you know, 1978, I am six years old, uh, the Kraftwerk appear on the TV and uh, they're singing the robots and okay. I lose my mind. As did you in. I yeah. pester my mom to buy that <laughs> album and I start playing that incessantly and I start studying the, the riffs. Oh, and playing it. But it's not, you know, like just trying to figure out those things and maybe, you know, record myself playing on top of with the recorder or experimenting with uh, multi-track recording by having two recorders. Uh, and then, you know, I would sing uh, happy birthday to you and then swap tapes and har harmonize on top of it. You know, that, that's that kind of, you know, very basic uh, experiments that you make so as self -motivated, a self-motivated, right? Totally. Couldn't get away from it. No. Nope. And then you were in school, like, were you a good student? So I was uh, not a good student, not, not because I wouldn't understand things. I, I would understand things. I just did not care. I, I would care more for my music. So, but I was lucky enough that uh, in, in high school, my piano teacher was, um, um, she was also working for the music business, so she was she was writing, composing for TV ads and and small soundtracks and things like that. So, and you know, at the same time, I had this love for computers because my brother was a big nerd himself, and you know, he got Vic Twenty for uh, you know for Christmas time when it was I think mm -hmm. twelve or thirteen, and you know, I started working with Basic, so I would program my routine and I could I have, see. you know, like I, I programmed my first drum beat on basic, on, on the VIC-20 that would go ooh, sh, ooh, ooh, sh, ooh, sh, ooh, ooh, sh. Computer sounds. Computer sounds. And you played to them? Of course I would. And did you get it, like during that, did you get in trouble with, with anything? <laughs> no, no, I was a very, no, I was a, I was a big nerd, really. So, so just into I the... locked myself in the room like we do now. <laughs> so always that way. Always. And then did you know you wanted to have a music career? And what did that look like to you? I, I, I just didn't see myself doing anything else. I just wanted to do it. I just wanted to be left alone doing my thing. That, that was my main concern, you know, because of course you live with your mom and, 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 and she say, hey, come to dinner. Only your hey, mom? No, mom and dad. No, no, I've got a, you know, uh, to get, I was, you know, no drama in my in my life. No drama. No drama. That's I've got, really I've got no blues. <laughs> so I was very lucky that way, obviously. Um, but yeah, I was, um, you know, left to my own. I was happy. So this is near near Rome, right? In Rome. In Rome. You were in Rome, so you grew up in a big city there. Yeah. Somehow you ended up here. But did you go to college? So so here's the story. The so, university, right? It's no, so that's how it worked. Uh, so my, my piano teacher was also doing this, uh, this gigs. And at some point she said, I know that you're good with computers and can you program drum machines? And I said, yeah, of course I can program drum machines. Well, why don't you come to this session? So I go to the session. Where'd you get a drum machine? Um, I, well, basically I would uh, 
program in, in, on, uh, on computers, so I, I knew how that worked. But also, this happened when I was like 14 or 15, something like that. I had an RX-11 okay. by Yamaha. Yeah. Or maybe I had a That's a later one, though. Uh, well, this must have been... So I was born in 1972, and this must have been like, uh, you know, 19, ni 1989. So I must have been 15 or 16, something or 17, something like yeah. that. So I already had my first synthesizer. My father had gifted for me for my 14th birthday a Krumer Stratus, which was like a wannabe Oberheim uh, made in Italy. A lot yeah. less expensive. Krumer is Italian, right? Krumer is Italian, that's right. So, so I, was, I already had uh, a little mixer that I've built myself. Uh, with the help of my brother, who, who was really much into electronics. So I had my little setup. So I already knew how to program drums, drum machines. So that's your background, keyboards and synthesizers. Yeah. And then now we're in high school. Did it, did you, now I'm in high did school. You, what, did you think of going to college, like music school? No, because basically what happened is that the, the guy where I went to do this session said, are you busy tomorrow? Because I could use your help. And I went, yeah, I go to school. Not in the afternoon, you don't. <laughs> That's right. So I started going some afternoons there. And then by the time I was 18, I got out of school. I was full time into that recording oh, you're studio. Oh, done. So it's like, and, and, I, and I did, you know, everything. I mean, at first I wasn't allowed to, to play the synths. I could only program the computer, Cubase 1.0. Uh, but then my boss started uh, explaining to me, look, this is the baseline. This is how you do it. So, you know, and, and he was kind enough to let me use the studio off when nobody was using it. Uh -huh. So I could practice my arrangements and my, and my, cause I was into jazz by then. So I was doing like fusion. I was into. Were there Chicago. jobs coming through? Oh, it was a stupidly busy studio. Oh, you're, I mean, so you're making money right away. I was making a lot of money because I was working full time in a recording studio in, near the Rai National TV. Yeah. So we would have all all kinds of starlets, all kinds of uh, uh, TV shows, um, records. Oh, so you found your way into the basic epicenter of of Italian entertainment music. That's, yeah. And it was getting out to people. Yeah. So why not just stay there? Why you're done? <laughs> Work forever, live in Italy, eat, drink, and right. be merry, right? Well, right. But um, also, my boss. Uh, uh, one day we were we were sitting in his car, and he starts playing this this record, and I hear. All on synth. And I was, <laughs> what the hell is this? And he goes, "This is Quincy Jones, man." And I go, who's Quincy Jones? You don't know Quincy Jones? Huh? Get out. It was a Quincy. Played so the entire, yeah, it was a juke joint, I think, he played to me. So that was the first thing that turned your head. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm in Italy and what's this? What's this? What's this? Also, there was this Italian uh, artist, uh, his name is uh, Sergio Caputo, who is like a, a jazz swing guy, very clever very clever lyrics, very sophisticated. I loved it. And, uh, and his pianist was a very good jazz pianist. And at a concert, I asked, where did you study? And he said, uh, at the Grove School of Music oh in boy. Los Angeles. That not, was not I, in Italy. Yeah, not in Italy. So I was 13 when I asked that question. And, uh, and in my mind, I have to go study in America. That, wow, you're that, yeah. and you're ready. And so you left a job. I left the job. At 20, I mean, my boss understood. I actually had a little fallout with my boss, uh, but then we recouped after. But I used that moment to go, you know what, this is a, because at that point I had worked like every day in the studio. And you have to imagine every day man, meant 10 a.m. till 3 a.m. That's every day with Ooh. no Saturdays and Sundays. Wow. So I was, I was also living with my parents, which meant I made a lot of money. Right. So I could afford to, go to study. I mean, of course, my, my parents helped me, but right. I, and, I paid most of it. And things had just fallen for you. That, like, it wasn't like you were giving up something you had struggled so hard to achieve. You achieved it because you worked hard as a kid and you were prepared and you were ready. Yeah. So you moved to the next thing. And then what? Did you know anyone here? <clears throat> yes. Uh, I had um, like a half uncle. 
but basically, and he was in Pacific Palisades, super rich, right? So he gets me to the airport and he gets me to Van Nuys, where the school was at the time. Right. And, uh, but he didn't look very happy to do that. I didn't know him. So basically I sleep one night there, drops me to Van Nuys. You know, I try to get a room and I find one and he leaves and I'm alone in this room in Van Nuys. And that, that's how I started this chapter. And that was a local place here, like where a lot of the studio musicians and like musicians, uh, com composers, arrangers would teach there. Dick Grove was well connected. Um, and then even young, other young aspiring artists, Steve Porcaro attended that place. I was leaving high school. Like uh, they let me drive off the campus and take some classes there, you yeah. know, when I was in like junior and senior year. Of, so it was kind of a well-known thing around here. I didn't know it was like so world renowned. Well, I, it, it probably wasn't, but I just happened to have a right. connection. You know, if, if that guy had studied at, the, at, 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 at Berkeley, I would probably have tried to go to Berkeley. But, you know, there was no internet. There was no information of any kind. You know, you're talking about the, the, the 80s. So you learned basically like extended harmony, right? Jazz harmony, uh, Well, at, at that stage, you have to imagine that by the time I was 20, I, I had already, I was already full-time producer. So I would literally, the boss would come in with the artist, with a guitar, maybe some tapes, I would pull down the tapes, program the drums, program the synths, record him or her. I was very good at uh, punching in and out. Because of course I had uh, a, you know a lot of years of practicing piano, and I had understood exactly the attack of that thing, yeah. so I could literally punch in like individual. You learn even the lag on the switch, right. right? You just you anticipate it, like a like a bass player plays early to on a stand up bass, right? You That's just, right. Or right when there. when you're recording a pad or strings, you play yeah. in advance, right? Right, with so a slow you, attack. With a slow something. attack, and it becomes automatic. And you know, you're playing a pad, you play a little bit in advance. In order yeah, to so I mean, you, you get familiar with like playing machines too, like tightening. Precisely. So so by, by the time I was 20, I knew already how to produce and mix a record. What'd you learn at Dick Grove? What, what, if you, still more. Well, number one, I, I learned um, the professional attitude because I, I always looked up to, and you know, as, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm trying to abandon my state of super fun, you know, it's like, woo, because you guys were the people I, I was looking up to. You know, I was listening to this MJ records, to the GRP records, to, the, to Quincy's uh, records and and I I wanted to be as good as the Americans, you know, from, from my perspective, that was my perspective. So I, um, just to see that in action and, you know, just see Dick Grove orchestrate vertically, you know, because if, if I needed to do it, make an arrangement, I would think in terms, okay, we do this line and then I harmonize it with this line, you know, singer comes in, third below, third above, fifth above, fourth, no, this doesn't work. So I would think linearly like that. But now Dick Grove steps in and shows me how to orchestrate vertically. So you've got your melody and now you're going And you know, even just this make my brain completely spin around and, and also see, you know, we would have play downs. So maybe the first was, uh, you know, two-part harmonization for trumpet and, and, and saxophone, all the way to full orchestration with the uh, string section. So we would record the stuff and I would see the process of recording and the logic and the perfection of the machine. And, um, and I learned so much. And then also I was an established producer in Italy. So I, had, I knew somebody and I said, listen, there are so many players here. If I get some good players, can I record something? Do you have a budget for me? I said, yeah, of course I would. So I got in touch with John Paritucci and Dave Weckl. They liked me. They gave me a good prize for us. You know, students want to be artists. And I recorded my first album at Chicoria Studio. Down Mad in Hatter. Mad Hatter in, uh, yeah, in with Bernie Griffith Kirsch. Park. Yeah, with Bernie Kirsch. He was the engineer there. And I became very good friends with Bernie. And, oh. and, and that's part of what, how nice I started person. my incredible, very underrated. Yeah, great. Ber Bernie's work is masterful. Look, listen to all the GRP stuff I saw him. Yeah, I, I've worked with him. We, we, when I was in a band with Diane Reeves and Billy Childs, we did, uh, Diane, her first solo album was, was there at Mad Hatter. 
and Bernie did it. It was a really fun experience all the way around. Well, so you were right, like falling in line now. So you're gonna have a successful career in Los Angeles, right? Um, maybe I don't know. I mean, the only reason why I got this, you know, I could do this album is because I had my credibility in Italy. So going back to Italy, then I had, you know, a record label contract, and uh, I did some promotion. So you you left LA. I left LA. Why? Because I don't want. I didn't want to be an illegal citizen here. Because I'm, I'm European, I need a green card, I need a permit to so be here. So you didn't want to do that and your home is, is Italy and you got what you needed, so you... I wouldn't have been able to go back. That was the problem because I, I had a one-year student visa. But if you, go, if you exceed that and then you leave, then you can't come back ever. So, okay. so I would have had to for, stay. But if it weren't for that, would you have stayed? Hell yes. Oh, hell yes. Yeah. I just didn't have the balls, to be honest with you. To, to be an illegal immigrant f at the age of yeah, 20. Yeah, I'm not with suggesting that, but you could stick, go through the, maybe go back, go through the process or whatever. But you went back to Italy. That's right. And then I was allured into the shiny world of pop music. And, uh, and also, you know, at this stage, I had come back to Italy with this big record. The whole industry was talking about me because I, he's done a record with John Petito and Dave Weggle, you know? And everyone was listening to it, and I was selling it as well. I mean, it was like a spin-off for Chicoria, really. It was uh, your songs. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like artistically, it wasn't uh, amazing. It was cool. I mean, but you know, it's like I, you know, I went to Mad Hatter for like four, for three days, uh, three or four days. We tracked it in one day, mixed it in two, and mastered it the other. You know, it's like yeah. So because I was very practical with the. Uh, with the system and and plus I had the best of the best, so it was easy to make a record. So that stayed in my mind forever. And I went to Italy and started selling those skills for pop music. And uh, and now of course I had more, a bit more of a status. And and uh, so they started asking me to play for bigger gigs, right? So so uh, you know I mean it's not names that you necessarily know in this YouTube setting, but. But you know, I played for I've played for Pino Daniele, I've played for Zucchero, I've played for um, the Ottavo Nano, which was like the Saturday Night Live band, in-house band. It was really educational because you know I, I was a you know I wanted to be a jazz player as well, but you know pop music teaches you to play on a click, like proper play on a click, to listen to the lyrics to comp singers. So, so you know, that, that was very educational. You know, the fact that y you learn how to serve the song and you learn to yeah. use your ears before you use your hands. It was great, right? And, and, and I even did a project as, a, as an artist. I went to San Remo, which is a very famous uh, music, fest festival. music festival. Uh, you know, we won prizes, you know, we, we, we ranked second. So we got, why did you move on from that? Because the music, the Italian music business was dying. After you just told me how great it was. It was great for me and I was certainly playing at high level, but then I could see the pay started going down. Like I, 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 I may even start, I mean, okay, let's talk numbers. My biggest pay in Italy at the time was I think 1,500 euros a night, you know, for big artists. That's a lot of money. You do like 10 gigs, you got 15 grand in your pocket. I mean, then you spend it a lot because you're young and stupid. Okay. But, or you buy a lot of synthesizers as well. But, but then this money started going down. Artists are still big, but hey, there's crisis. Hey, this year the tour is not going to have okay. so, so many. So you didn't feel it was compensating you well. Up until not it enough. did. Right. So then did that, is that yes. what triggered you to move to the next? No, I wasn't happy with the music I was making. The music too. So the both. The, 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 the money was going down and the music was too. The music was either f staying the same or not, not progressing with the rest of the world. Is I, that fair to say? I didn't think that they had uh, the idea of making good music to put out in the world. It was more, um, hey, this is the nephew of uh, uh, this record label uh, manager, let's make him a record, let's make him famous. And he or she would be for a while, but not on the merits. So the pure talent wasn't rising to the surface. Nah. It was all connections and... Yes. And then you just 
could see that it wasn't evolving, and then the pay scale's going down. So then, and then, then what do you do? And then, and then what you do? Do you go back to America? I still can't. And also, w would I leave everything behind? Because n never mind, you know, it's what, 6.30 right now, I can't stop working and call my mom because she's sleeping, right? And what would happen if my family needs my help? So I decided for the next best thing, London. Because you can get some music action. Because I could get the linguistic platform, because I could get better business, because I was closer, it was cl music that was closer to my heart and it was close enough to Italy that yeah. when my parents would eventually get right. older, I Perfect. could still assist them. So you, you picked up and moved to London. Did you know anyone there? Zero. You just showed up. Yeah, basically I, re I erased whatever effort I made in Italy and I became a zero. Because, I mean, I went to being cozy with the, yeah, I don't know, the artistic director of Sony Music Italy, or, you know, being called, hey, uh, Brian Adams, uh, keyboard player is down, we need a replacement. I would play with uh, Brian Adams for the Italian leg of the tour. Like, stuff like that would happen. Um, uh, but, um, but in London, I was a nothing. So I tried to use my pop skills but now, you know, I tried to contact 19 management to write for them, but I simply didn't have the level to be frank with you. So maybe this is the first time you had to face some adversity. Uh, yeah, I mean, you also always have to face adversity in Italy because even getting paid is tough because... Yeah, that's a bit unfair, but it, it sounded like relatively smooth sailing. And now you're in a place yeah, where it's just like, you gotta definitely. get inside, it's a new country. Definitely. There's an established group yes. of people, you know, it's like yes. you don't have any friends. And I'm 30 as well. So I did it at 30 because I, I, I thought that if I waited, because I was surviving, I was making all right money. I couldn't, be, I couldn't buy a house with the money that I would make, forget yeah. it, but I could get by. So, so now I'm in London and I re, I, I, it's, it's really a struggle. So I start applying for jobs as in-house producer and I found this one as an in-house producer for a techno trance label. So I go, I go there and now they're showing me how to make house music and techno music and how they're using gates and a uh, 16 note trigger to just make like fake sequencers, <laughs> you know, and I go, that's a very clever idea. So I started getting into this Brits techniques that they, they make and I started getting an appreciation for house music finally uh, and for electronic music finally from being a jazz knob right. to being you know wow house music is not just pump up the gym pump it up it's, it can be also Louis Vega it can be Spina it can be uh, you name it Right. So you, you, through your job you, you learned yes. another school and that started opening up my mind and um, and yes, I, and I was I was thirsty for better music. I was really thirsty, and certainly London gave me that. But you're still not Doctor Mix. I'm still not Doctor Mix. But you're gaining the components of who Doctor Mix That's is. That's right. The music background, the classical music, the experience working, doing media of all sorts, That's playing right. piano, accompanying. You had already developed your ear as a child. Now you're in London learning house music. Yeah. putting together what the yeah. synthesizer idea, the computers, yeah. it's all starting to come together, right? That's right. Then so, you don't stay there. No, I don't stay there because I never. <laughs> so, so what happens is that I, um, I started making my own project. I called it Sunlight Square because that was my address. Not a very good name. But uh, I started having a bit of success actually in the house, Latin house and Afro house. And I started getting some, you know, some success, you know, going to do gigs, but also kept my uh, music production jobs, you know, remotely, working remotely. Yeah. And I thought at some point, you know what? I don't want to mix my Sunlight Square project with my uh, commercial work. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it Dr. Mix. I'm going to do oh. drmix.com and I'm going to take orders online. It happened. I, it happened. So I start doing this thing and the website pops. And I start getting tons of orders. A website called Dr. Mix. Dr. Mix. I, start, I started it in uh, 2006. Because you're good at mixing. Because I'm good at mixing, because I'm good at finishing other people's music, that, because that's what I've always so done. So you're doing it, you opened it up like it was kind of your own business now. Correct. Right? Okay. So now I'm getting orders and 
I need help. So I said, let me start hiring. So I started hiring. So Sunlight Square started working, Dr. Mix started working, and now I had this company going. And, um, and, that, and that's when I said, uh, and that's when I said, I need more customers through this door. And I tried SEO, hired an SEO expert, paid lots of money. That didn't really help. That's search engine optimization. Search engine so like optimization. To, to, to find out if you're, how to get more people, right. get two more people on the and, internet. And um, I spent a lot of money on consultants. And at some point, they, uh, one of these consultants said, I cannot grow your channel, uh, your, your website more than this. You have to start making content. So Ooh, now we're getting to. So now we're getting closer. So I registered Dr. Mix, the, uh, the website, uh, the channel. And, oh, the uh, YouTube channel. The YouTube channel. But this is early YouTube, right? This is this. We're talking about two thousand. No, I I I doubled in in YouTube in two thousand and five. I, I even had a um, uh, like a viral video called Simpsons versus Star Trek. I'm gonna leave a link in the description f for you, so like you can put it in the, okay. in the description. And uh, it was like a two million uh, oh. views at a time where the top one was five million, and I just That's a big basically video. merged. With mashup, mashup, and it went viral. But I didn't pay much attention to it uh, because, hey, cool. It, it wasn't a thing, you know. Being yeah. a YouTuber wasn't a thing. It was 2005, so I let that sleep. And then in 2012, I pick it back up and I say, okay, oh, let's call seven it seven years. Mix. You sat on yeah. it. I sat on it seven years. I sat on it seven years. Do you think you should know? I mean, you, you, that, that was stupid. You should have kept making it. That was so you stupid. Like, oh, I got two million views. I would have it. been PewDiePie by now. I didn't understand the power of it. I was too busy with my Sunlight Square project, you know, baby. This is gonna make me famous, you know. So, so, so that was stupid. But then, you know, I started the channel again, and I said, "All right, oh, by this time, I had premises," because. You know, I had a son, uh, young, and I couldn't keep on working from home, so I hired a venue. So, um, mm. so now I'm making videos on how to export from Cubase and Pro Tools, you know, for online mixing and mastering. Showing people your skills as a mixer. Not even that. I was just demonstrating things like utility videos. Or, for example, I would demonstrate pieces of gear, because I wanted to listen to how, I, you know, 1176 sounded. So I took a 76 and you know run, crank it all the way up, and then just show how it sounds. So you put it in the video. Put it in the video. So I I did like for the three years I, I didn't even show my face. It was just my hands and gear. Did they do well? No, <laughs> but they did get more clients through the door. Okay, I and mean, that was really your goal. So you were satisfied. Yeah, I was satisfied. But then one day um, I meet this guy who works for the. Uh, Queen Mary University of London, where they have a department where they're building this experimental synthesizer, which is, it was simple thing because it was like a, um, it was a TV monitor really, uh, with, a, with a thing on top and some keyboards, and it looked very, very interesting. It's called the Crazy Synthesizers Demo. That video went nuts. Like nuts! Like uh, it made like 15 million on on mm. on, on uh, Facebook, and it's now I think it's like seven or eight. Million what year is this when it came out? This is we're talking 2015, 15, 16. Because it's a few years later than 2012, like after you. Yeah, yeah, like three or okay. four years so later. 15, 16. Okay, and then you saw that video, video was, and that's another life changer for you. I uh, I didn't do it until Google called me. Because it because because of the YouTube because of the YouTube video and the Facebook video, basically I had spiked Google Trends for the word synthesizer to the point that Google called me. So they called me up and say, um, maybe we should have a talk. Yeah. Who like a person called? Well, you? they had this uh, this program that was called YouTube Partners, I think. Oh, that sounds. And familiar, yeah. if you had more than thirty thousand subscribers, which I got immediately after that, I mean, because it took me like three years to get to like eight or 9,000, and it took me like one afternoon to get to 30,000. Yeah. Wow. So, right? So if you are over 30,000, then your channel was legit. 
like as opposed to you know just you know copying videos from 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 whatever and posting them that if if you're really a creator they would give you help so they give me help i go to I go to oh, Google because they want you to be successful. Yeah. Well, what would they say? So they said, uh, "Well, listen, let's analyze uh, your channel for a sec." So you've done, I don't know, maybe, maybe I had done at the time like a oh, hundred videos or something, and and they go, "So when you talk about synthesizers, you get a lot more. How about if you make more videos about synthesizers?" Okay. They also offered their studios. You remember the YouTube space that were in every city? So if you were like a bigger YouTuber, you could go there and use their I do remember that. $5 million yeah. dollar facility. Right, to make videos. Yeah, so what did I do? I hired synthesizers. So I would hire like four synthesizers a day, go there, shoot four videos, oh. eight videos actually, because it was uh, one uh, like general view and one just fun. Well, you took their advice. Make I more took synthesizer their advice. videos yes. and just... Rent the synthesizers you need. That's right. Did you, and you went to YouTube Space. And I went to YouTube Space. So you had a better looking videos, yes. right? And and properly produced. At that time, I already had like three employees. So I had you know full time video producer, two full time audio producers, and. But you're making. But why? I mean, you were making a living. You were trying to get mixed clients. Now you're making yeah. videos. Like how? That's right. That starting to take a lot of your time. That's right. Because sometimes life takes you on a different path. You maybe you're aiming for somewhere. But maybe your life is telling you that you really should kind of pivot. Yeah. Because this was an opportunity. Okay, I, I called it Dr. Mix. But now people were interested in me playing synthesizer. Duh, I'm a musician. Right. You know, <laughs> but you right. live and learn, right? So, okay. Well, fine. show them and find out. Too. Show them and find out. So, all of a sudden, now I'm appearing on video. Because before you could see only my hands, I, I would even dub it, overdub it, because I, I was yeah. too shy. So, so now oh, you're I, too shy. Oh yeah, you got over that. <laughs> so so yeah, there I am now. I'm you know hi and welcome to Doctor Mix and it, and 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 it's and it's evolved and it took a life of its own. That was the journey. I mean, so it's a pretty much it went it was a from straight line from thirty thousand to one hundred thousand in one year. From then on, it basically went to almost seven hundred thousand of now in the course of like three years. Three years, but the mix business you kept it going, right? Sure. So it still did what you wanted, but then you, you basically created like a new thing. That's right. In parallel. That's right. It appears to me you have other products too besides mix selling your mixing services, right? You well, offer... I, I started I started making digital products. I mean, from then on, it's just the the story of a YouTuber, you know. So so you start making your digital products, uh, your sound packs, and you know all the things that you learn. You use them to make useful products, and and you gently put them out, and people like them and they buy them. Well, and, you've proven yeah. your value and to them that there's something to be had by by learning from you. I learned from you. Uh, firstly, I, I, it's just you know, oh, <laughs> thank you. You but can't yeah, you can't know everything, so you find somebody that engages you, and then you turn it off if they don't tell you anything, and then. You're you're offering real information, so it's just very interesting. You started out basically just making ads for your mix business. That's right. And before you know it, it turns out you're really just showing the world what you could do. And then you you changed your person. Is it fair to say you changed your personality from a shy person? Because you said you I were shy. I was never shy. But well, then I, why you said you were? I was shy. I was camera shy. So so look, okay. I I've ra I was raised on a stage, so I've I'm, I'm used to. Play to big but crowds as well. That's, that's different. different. I've learned that. That's different. So, so all of a sudden, you know, you have to show that you are in your studio. Is my studio good enough? Or oh, maybe this angle. Let me show this angle. I don't know if I should show that. Maybe I should be composed. Yeah. You know, and you're full of these things that you're thinking. It's to reveal your. It's like anything. Like a singer's, they have to do it. Right. Revealing yourself, and right. it's never is like, do I have enough? Do I have enough to show? Yeah, that's what it is to me. I think, and and, and once you realize, I think the turning point is like, I don't have to be perfect. As soon as, and that's what r makes it good for people. Yeah, because otherwise you're talking at people and not sort of with them. Yeah, because I think you you engage people like I feel like I'm going on a journey with you. You're not like talking at me. Like a pedantic type of teacher. Yeah. 
and here That's you go. Right. So, so then you make this channel, and then why are you here? <laughs> That's right. What right do you have to, well, to you be telling out, us? You watched a couple of my videos, I guess, yeah. and then you responded in a direct message, and yes. then I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. Dante, who is my producer and director and editor, and my son, said, Dr. Mix is pinging us. So we go, like, well, let's respond right away. Yeah. And then we're, you know, we, we got to talking to each other. Yeah. And then you said, I think we should meet. And yeah. Of and I just course. wanted to do this. I said, as long as I remember, I remember saying this to you, as long as you're going to let me find out who you are. Because <laughs> that was the one thing I really wanted to do. And I think I wanted people to, I couldn't find very much really this level of depth on you. And I feel like everybody else that really, we, we want to know answers to questions. So I prepared a lightning round of questions based on, you know, basically YouTube stuff yes. that people have asked, yeah. popular questions. And then I asked my team, Ben, my audio guy, Will, my DP, and Dante, who I just introduced, director, producer, editor, some, and, and Bo, yeah. my main guy that I've been working with for 15 years. They put questions together. Yep. They threw them in. Right. So here's the questions. They're in the order that they were sort of thrown at me. And we just pulled this together, right? Just before the interview. Why are you called Dr. Mix? Uh, because by being a long time in the music business, I understood that artists suffer from instability. And a lot of times you just need to do the right thing. You need to listen to the track give a diagnosis and find a solution. And, and that is like very basic, it's un, un, unsentimental. It's like being at the doctor. What is your real name? My real name is Claudio Ezio Maria Salvatore Passavanti. <laughs> Dr. Mix is shorter. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was a question on Google. How old is Dr. Mix? Dr. Mix is 51 as we speak. As we speak, and by the time this is over, you'll be a little older, like I will be. Where is Dr. Mix's studio? So we don't have to say the location, but are it's you, in London. You like London? I love it. Uh, London uh, made me. Is your internet persona the same as in real life? So, so when you are in front of the camera, there are a few things that you learn. Is that if you have five of energy, it will look like one. If you have ten of energy, you will look like five. That's why I put 100, because I can say this, or I can say this. You know, it's a matter of projection. We also know assertiveness. So it's just, I can simply, hi, and welcome to Dr. Mix. Or I can go, hi, and welcome to Dr. Mix. Or hi, and welcome to Dr. Mix. I'm gonna catch more of your attention, you know, and then I'm gonna give you hopefully useful things, but, That's, you know. You know, it reminds me of like the stage actors because they didn't have sure. microphones and then the audience would be really far yep. away and they would overdo everything, yeah. and by the time it got to the back row, yeah. it was right. But you know this by mu from music. It you makes know, you sense. Can go, do, 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 or you could go, do, 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 do. Totally right. You know, it's like... And at the end of the arpeggio, you could go... Yeah. And then they connect, they could see that you yeah. did something up There's to the movement. high range, and why do conductors... We talked about yeah. this the other day when you're conducting. Yeah. You know, you mark the beat when you have yeah. to, to keep everybody together, but most of the time, you just want to overdo the gesture so that all the orchestra knows yeah. where you are in terms of the feel. Correct. And then so does the audience and everybody sort of follows. Show, don't tell. Totally makes sense. So what is the reason for the way you dress in a color scheme? So you're dressed today. Yeah, I'm dressed as Dr. Mix today. So when, you, when I studied composition, photo composition, graphic design, and I've learned that having a reduced color palette that in my case is black, red, brown, right? So if you, if you look at, I mean, I've got white today as well because it's wow. summer, but you know, I, I tend to have a color palette that you can identify me by. So when, even if you don't know that, whether that's my video or not, I you see. notice the color palette and you know oh. that it's associated with And did with you me. think of that right from the beginning? Oh yeah. You, oh. You, well, you, you kind of work, you work your you way in, yeah. yeah, and then, you know, I got also, you know, professional advice on this. You did, because there's a lot of things to learn in making these videos, yeah. to do it right. But red is a touch of color, 
that that makes you more notice in a in a video if you could go back to the beginning would you do anything differently in the beginning i guess the beginning of youtube i wouldn't have given up on on my first channel culture killer the one where i did uh, simpson versus star trek I, I i would be on it you just keep going cuz that's what I would we have learned kept going the, you, 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 you you have to go through the process to know so you just you just delay it i just delayed it yeah but you then you know you just figured it out yeah i i would probably be doing better at the stage uh, you know having maybe you know 20 uh, you know 18 years of of youtube rather than than 10 right. but but it's also like you know you caught up pretty well and then you'd come at it a little differently and it's hard to know what you I, I wouldn't have you know I wouldn't have done my sunlight square thing that yeah. that you know Which you can I bring, really love it you can bring that to the Oh yeah that's what I mean so I, I still tour with that project No but it, so, you okay. answer the question because it's yeah. like these are unfair questions sometimes it's like yeah, yeah. I would just fix all my mistakes yeah. but then you wouldn't have learned the, from the mistakes which is mostly where you learn so Why did you make such a commitment to making videos? Cuz this is a slightly different question yeah. because it's not like, eh, make a video, yeah. I spend like a couple hours and then I get to be able to release yeah. two a week. I mean, that's a huge commitment. It is. Um, so you have to think about it this way. Uh, unless you want to be home and perform for yourself, which is totally legitimate. I've done it for years and I'm happy with that. But if if you want to talk to people and have uh, you need a stage. Right now the stage is this. you know where's people attention on this thing look yeah. around you right now how many people are You're looking right. at this everyone go so to any public square and see who doesn't have a phone because it's easier to count who doesn't yeah and and make videos because when you make videos you never know one day anthony marinelli may call you up and say come to la <laughs> you see what i mean it's like you open up to possibilities i'm glad you're here why did you make youtube your home because that's kind of your home uh because i love the relationship that, that i have with this audience they 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 like me i like them back a lot it's very a different, much so right? it's different than other platforms they they leave comments i can respond to those comments i can it's it's a dialogue sometimes they give me inspiration to make a video or they ask me questions and for me like the, you know art is a two way street yeah and there's really no other thing like it i mean for for that what you just said the two way street aspect of it and the length that you could there's just so yeah. much you can do with it it's called social media social is means both ways <laughs> so not just some fun stuff yeah what was your first synth i guess besides that organ the krumar yeah krumar stratus after that the roland d50 okay so you, that's like a good more household name do you have a dream synth right now yes Uh if I could put my hands on a CS80 or a Jupiter 8 I would be extremely happy. Oh. That's doable. I just came up with this question. It's not really something I've seen or anybody asked me to ask you. What is your dream thing to do that you would do that you would stop everything that you're doing for? Everything that you're doing right now. If somebody could present it to you and say, "I will let you do this at the level you want to do it right now." build a bigger studio You would stop everything to do that. Oh yeah. And what would be in that studio? Oh, I would have uh multiple rooms. I have I would have rehearsal rooms down. I would have composition rooms. I would have a recording room with drums, microphones, selection of preamplifiers. Oh. And uh and yeah, and yeah. You want yeah. to be in like a gear heaven. I want to have the studio that you had. <laughs> okay. The one the, the 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 big one that yeah. you did all the I had a post-production dream studio with right. composer rooms yeah. and scoring stage and that. state of the art type of thing and it was done. I was able yeah. to design it. I I showed this to Claudio. Okay, and then the last thing I really want to know is like why really did you come here to do this? Um it's it feels like it's uh one of those uh circle round circle kind of moments where i've i've always idolized american music i've always listened to jazz jazz changed my mind in a completely profound way and uh and and somehow to to know that america was calling me because 
somehow they America likes what I do. Uh, majority of my uh, pu public is in America, by the way. It's my number one nation where 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 my audience is. And uh, I came here to see if that door really seemed to open because it's an unfinished dream for me. So you think you'll be back? I know I'll be back. This is the beginning of reconnecting with LA. Yeah, and there are things also that I cannot speak about, but there are things, there are things that make me think that it's a good idea that I spend a little bit more time in America. Ooh, I didn't said I could say that, but yeah, I love this place, man. I love to make music here. America I, is LA different? Well, yeah, I mean LA is America's also, huge. America's huge, but but LA specifically, come on, you, you you can go to the beach in the morning and compose in the afternoon and go to see Quincy Jones's band at night. Where else does it happen? Let's face it. Yeah, I'm not gonna move. <laughs> of course. I love it here. Well, I really thank you for giving me that opportunity to ask you all these questions. I'm, I hope that all of the Dr. Mix fans are a little more satisfied with some of the questions. You know, we were wondering about this guy, who is this guy, but he really does have a lot of talent. I've watched him play and his ear is great. He can pick stuff out of the air and figure it out. And he has a deep um, desire, I think, to be musical and share the knowledge with, yeah. with us. And I'm, I'm happy to have him here and, and make the video with him and, and share in doing uh, another, we, we got a few more things in store, right? Because he just got here. Yeah. So looking forward to that and we'll see you soon. In the words of Quincy, you make a living with what you get and you make a life with what you give.